The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today, I wanted to title the message, How to Minister and How to Receive Ministry. Now, here's the catch. From the heart. Oh, I have to throw that in there just to make things difficult. Because as believers, we can know a lot of things in our head. We can know about God. But the, the real imperative at this point in time is to function from the heart. And before you can function and minister to others from the heart, I think there's some basics that uh, need to be reaffirmed. Uh, uh, I want to give a, a definition because uh, much of what we've written in books, like Jennifer said, uh, without Dennis, there would have been nothing to write. Um, without Jennifer, it would have never gotten written. So you put the two gifts together and you get, a, you get a, some kind of solution. Husbands and wives, take note of that because that's good for you too. Because when you got married, you became a new creation. Besides the new birth, new creation. When the two came together and we became one spirit, it's a brand new creation, something that never existed before. And it becomes an expression of Jesus to the world around you. Now, I was complimented in Publix. Nothing like telling you about when you're complimented, right? Make sure everybody knows you're complimented. I was in Publix, and the little clerk goes, Oh, this, you and Jennifer are my favorite married couple. <laughs> so I go, okay, that's just a clerk in Publix, but you know what? A witness is a witness, right? That's good enough for me. So <clears throat> anyway, but much of what was learned uh, uh I believe as a baby Christian, God led me to, he said he was going to take me to the school of the spirit before I did any Bible school training or anything. He says, I'm going to take you in the school of prayer. And one of the things that I knew from the onset, that when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, discerning of spirits was as easy as breathing for me. I know there's a gifting in it. But I also saw that it can be trained and that every believer needs to be trained in discerning of spirits. And I'll tell you why. Number one, l- let me give you the definition. This is out of the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. Definition of discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is the ability to discern the spirit world. Okay, it's not natural. The spirit world and especially to detect the true source, the true source. Say that back to me the true source of circumstances and motives of people. Ooh, some people get a little little antsy on motives of people. How dare you judge my motives? Discernment actually picks up on the flavor behind the words. Now, ladies, have you ever been complimented and felt creepy? You might be picking up what was behind the words, no matter how gracious the words are. It's the source, the source, the source. And intimacy with God is going to demand the church get back to the source. True intimacy, there's really no real fruitfulness in your Christian life without intimacy. Intimacy produces it. But intimacy is is not just some uh, gushy emotional feeling. It's spirit to spirit, breath to breath, heart to heart. It's a, it's a, a spiritual exchange that's taking place uh, we even used the term once, uh, a romance of wills. We have an instructor down in Alabama. She changed it a little bit. She says, I teach your romance of wills as a dance of wills. And my ladies like that better. So fine, if anything we can improve upon, I'm going to take it from you and say, God gave it to me after I give you acknowledgement one time. Uh, after that, it's mine, right? If it ministers to me, it's mine. I own it. Okay, so... A romance of wills or a dance of wills, all right? Doesn't that sound like a nice relationship, though? Huh? I don't know. I was a dancer. I won dance contests when I was a teenager. And so, I don't know, that word dance kind of triggers better than, huh? A dance of wills. 
wow, we can really just get it off on the romance of Jesus as a dance of wills. Now, <clears throat> all you stubborn people, repent right now because a dance of wills requires surrender, yielding. Oh, all of your favorite words in your vocabulary, right? And God has been saying, okay, Dennis, teach the men now that to walk in the Spirit is also to drive in the Spirit. Best sermon we ever got was from Jennifer in the kitchen. Everybody knows that sermon. Honey, the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. And it's God's road. <laughs> and those are His people. And God placed them exactly on the road where He wants to. The essence of the kingdom is love. I was already convicted on my knees, repented by this time, but the rest is just kind of like extra information. The essence of the kingdom is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. So if you think you walk in the Spirit, the real acid test for spirituality is, do you drive in the Spirit? Hmm? Because those are not just cars, those are people. And if, there wasn't, if they weren't encapsulated in a car and they were just there, you wouldn't be thinking, acting, or behaving the way you do when you're in a car. Isn't that something? We detach. We think we have a right to detach because I'm in this vehicle. I am not a person anymore. I am a machine. Yeah, no. All right. So anyway, uh, discerning of spirits is the ability to discern the spirit world and especially to detect the true source of circumstances and the motives of people. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says something that's very important and we need to tuck it away. Uh, 2.14 says, The natural man does not receive, and everything I want to preach today is on receiving and giving, giving and receiving, but in the spirit realm. The natural man does not receive, it's foolishness to him. They can't know because they are spiritually discerned. You have to use another sense of operation to determine what's going on. In the spirit realm, you discern, you distinguish. That means you differentiate. This is soul. This is spirit. This is good. This is evil. Yeah. This is right. This is wrong. There's a distinction that's made, but it requires spiritual perception. So, many people in the early years as a pastor, um, almost all of our books came out of uh, dealing with people who had an initial encounter with God and then the subsequent relationship that followed. And Jennifer literally documented that process. So it's not a formula or a method as much as you get impacted with a genuine encounter, spirit to spirit. Here is the subsequent process that works out. Now, when uh, a spiritual person says, discerns all things, So we have to ask ourselves, are we spiritual or are we carnal? The natural man doesn't receive because it's foolishness to him. He's rather, he, you can grow up having more confidence in your intellect. And we're not throwing understanding away, but we're not going to lean on our understanding. And we're going to acknowledge. Acknowledge takes place here through divine, intimate connection. Acknowledge means spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. It's a, it's a subjective experience. Now, it says the spiritual man discerns all things. The natural man, what? It's foolishness to him. He can't discern. And uh, we, sh we shared this last week. My favorite expression was a person who was very intellectual, who basically was listening to Christians talk and said, <sighs> It's like you people know something I don't know. <laughs> Duh. Precisely. There is a knowing. How, how many people when they even uh, were born again, the first thing they said was, I know that I know. Because you know in your head, but you know in your heart. There is a dual awareness. And training people to discern in the days that we're living in, especially with all the heresies that are out there right now. Uh, uh, Jennifer is going to teach on the creeds eventually, because the creeds is what kept, was actually 
the creeds were developed to come against all of the things that were coming against Christian doctrine. And it was in response to heresies, and they popped up almost immediately with the fledgling church. So creeds need to be taught and understood. Uh, matter of fact, uh, John Wesley felt that uh, in the early, early, not now maybe, but in the early Methodist movement, they were pretty much heresy free because they stayed, they stayed on the basic creeds of what to believe, and it kept them somewhat safe. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking for Jennifer to teach on that. But <clears throat> gifting is one thing. Uh, discerning and discernment needs to be more daily discernment. And that can be developed. And so let's let's start a little bit on just how that would start. Before you worry about discerning other people. See, through gifting, as a baby Christian, I, well, I was probably obnoxious without knowing how obnoxious I was. Uh, I would have, a, a, I can remember being just a, oh, in my 20s, and uh, one of the teachers said, Dennis, you need to be in the classroom. And I said, okay, you don't have to be angry. See, she was smiling and saying it real sweet, but she, in her gut, she would like, I'd like to take this kid and shake him. <laughs> All right? So I would answer based on the discernment, not answer on the basis of how sweet she told me I needed to be in my classroom. And he'd be like, okay, you'd like to be, I'm not angry. Although that's the one thing is when discernment sometimes puts its finger on something, suddenly you get the manifestation of what was really there. Used to, a bad illustration of that was I learned, this is, this is carnal. Jennifer won't want me to say this, but anyway. It, when someone is acting sweet, but they're really, they're really uh, controlling. I remember one time saying, yeah, but you're out of control. I am not out of control. <laughs> See, you press the button on that and out it pops. So... You say, okay, that's discerning other people. That's the gift of discerning of spirits, discerning the true source or motive of people. In other words, what's behind their words and circumstances. What's really behind the circumstances? There's a lot of circumstances that are nothing more than agendas, you know, and they can be deadly agendas. People have schemes and plans, and it can look good. But good is not necessarily God. Hmm. And actually evil, to really seduce a Christian, doesn't have to use blatant evil when it can use something that looks good. That would be the bigger trap. Look at the fruit on the tree. Isn't it good? It's pleasing to the eye. It'll make you wise. Oh, but I forgot. God said don't. <laughs> but it was so good. <laughs> All right. Now, here's where I want to start. And <clears throat> Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 should be a lesson for every believer. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. This is the way God trained me. Even though there was a gifting of discerning of spirits, he wanted daily discernment. Because the spiritual man, and I wanted to be a spiritual man, and you want to be a spiritual man or woman, discerns all things. Well, gifting is kind of flashes of insight. Gifting does not operate constantly. But it got to the point where a walk in the Spirit can be the combination of the two to where you become quite healthy. The gifting operates as a flash of insight, but the daily discernment is far more valuable because that's character development and that's more constant and you become more consistently constant. That's a good word, right? Christy, Christy likes to do word, she's a wordsmith. Consistently constant. And that is really the challenge. So I said, all right, well, people were saying, you know, um, <clears throat> Uh, things like, well, Dennis, you know, you've got the gifting, but I can't tell where the gifting leaves off and the walk in the Spirit starts. And that should be the way it is with discernment. The spiritual man discerns all things. What does all mean? 
all of life. You should be saying, uh, in, in the spirit realm, this is what God is doing. In the natural realm, there's good and evil. It's almost like three realms. There's really only two realms. There's God's realm and there's the, 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 the but when it comes to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you have to have a, a discriminating palate that can make a distinction between something that's good but not God. Evil, <laughs> that can be blatant. You don't even need discernment for some evil. It's so obvious. But the not so obvious is what's going to keep the average believer safe. Learning what is good but not God to discern and make that distinction. Remember, definition of discerning of spirits is to know the motive and the true source of people and circumstances, but it's to distinguish, these are key words, distinguish, differentiate, This is that, that is, it. it's like a, a, as we get in Hebrews 4. Uh, and where does all this discernment take place? This is not about just your understanding. That's understanding. That's judge. You can judge with your head real well. But listen to this, in, uh, before we get to Hebrews 4, I want to jump up to this. Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance, in other words, from the heart, whatever is really in there will end up speaking, regardless of those wonderful, nice words. In other words, the overflow of the heart. Now, uh, that can be confusing if you don't understand heart. And we're going to get into that a little bit, but... Uh, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. Remember, the spiritual man discerns all things. If you're going to be a spiritual man or woman, you need to distinguish the source, the source, the source. Proverbs 4, 20 to 23, my son, give attention to my words, incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. This is where my word didn't translate when Jennifer was, when I was discipling Jennifer to get her out of her brilliant mind into her heart. The part that she didn't understand was keep them in the midst of your heart. My word was cherish. And it didn't quite translate for her subjectively. I says, the things that God does, things that were quickened to me, I hold them in here and it's like, oh. It's, a, it's not only an aha, it's a light goes on and there is a knowing that exceeds understanding. Doesn't the scripture say in Ephesians, to experience the love of God that exceeds understanding. I want what exceeds understanding. I'm not throwing understanding out the door. I'm simply saying I want what exceeds my understanding. I want to experience the love of God which far surpasses understanding. I want both, but my priority is I want the real thing. And the church, there's going to be young people that are going to come during a, a time of tremendous harvest in the church, and they're going to want the real thing. They're not going to want cutesy poo. They're going to want experience, and they're going to want an experience that cor is corroborated within them that facilitates real change. If it's not a changed life, I'm not even interested. I'm not interested in more information. I'm interested in transformation so that you become a living epistle and what has transformed in you is to actually decree and declare. People will, what do you like to say, I, I think Dennis and Jennifer have the best marriage when a public employee says that as a clerk. There's, I didn't preach to them. I didn't teach them all that I know about Jesus. To me, that, is, that was far more fulfilling than, oh, that was a good message. Do you understand the difference? Because one was an expression of my life, the other was information. Now, hopefully when I preach you get more than information, but you understand what I mean. It's one thing to say it's a nice sermon, but that it, what happens in a grocery store was far more real to me. Because then it's more like whatever's been transformed in me is somehow living through me and expressing. The highest form of communication is really expression. I don't mean just words. I mean, when you, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the highest form of communication. 
It wasn't just by the, the life that he lived, the death that he died, uh, the miracles, the signs that he had done, all the things that he said. Those things are glorious. But I'll tell you what, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the highest form of communication. And God's looking for changed lives, not just informed people. Now, if keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. We're going to have to learn how to keep our heart, how to guard your heart. And if you, you can't discern, you don't know how to guard your heart. <laughs> it's not what goes in the mouth. This is Jesus' words in Matthew 15. It's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles the person. And, uh, you know, I, I trained uh, with, uh, in faith camp teaching. Uh, for I did everybody's camp because <laughs> I didn't know what was going on, and God didn't let me go to Bible school at first, so I took everybody's Bible school. <laughs> but in the faith camp, I like the expression, you know, life and death are in the power of the tongue. They say it over and over again. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. I love it. But often when I would ask people, what do you mean by that? They'd say words. And I'm, no, the source of words, the power of those words, the power of the tongue, not just the words themselves. I've seen flattery. I've seen, I've seen uh, false compliments. I've seen lies. I've seen stuff all done with a smile and with flowery words. But the source was wrong. God's going to take a people and... He's going to get you that in your quiet time that you don't just look at your life at your behavior. He's going to mess with your motive. And there's nothing more obvious to a discerning person than a motive that's not real. But looks good. Now, if you're fully convicted and fully committed that I'm going to live out of the source of Jesus in me, then here's where you're going to start. You're not going to start with discerning what's going on with people or circumstance. You do not start there. You start with, in the reading of the Word, you don't read for mere understanding. You're going to read the Word until that Word discerns you. Ugh. The best change lives I've seen would take Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, and they'd recognize that the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. I get very offended when people say, I got zapped, I got this. I mean, I know they say that stuff, but I got zapped. This, ooh, ah, ah. No, he's a person. And you treat a person better than an it. Hmm? And I'll never forget the time that God took my head and pulled it down in my prayer time. I thought it was the strangest feeling. I was reading a scripture about Gideon and the Lord put on, on uh, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And I remembered when I was a kid, I was a, like a superhero. I always had a bath towel tied around my neck and jumped off furniture with a cape. You know, you can't be a superhero without a cape. Unfortunately, that on my TV translated into my understanding of some scriptures. And so I saw, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and I saw this swashbuckler with the cape of anointing on, and he was going to do great deeds for God. And I actually felt pressure to look at the bottom of the page where there was a tiny little footnote. <laughs> and the little footnote said, a better translation would not be that the that Gideon put on the Spirit, but that the Spirit put on Gideon. And I saw this in my mind's eye. Oh, oh, that's a different perspective of being in the anointing. In other words, God put him on like a glove. And it wasn't about him being the swashbuckler. It was about God doing what he wanted through him. It was no longer a Gideon story. It was a God story. He entered into the God story, not the Gideon story. Does that make sense? But that's the way God wants to use us. He wants us to yielded and surrendered that he puts us on. We don't put him on and use him. He says, no, I want, I want to use you, but I want to go through you. I want to be the initiator. Uh -oh. So, we're all going to learn to do this before the day is out.
you're all going to be proficient at this because you're all going to look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division. That's differentiate. The division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you never went any farther than that, you'd know what I've been talking about already. Right? It makes a distinction. It differentiates. This is soul, this is spirit, this is joint, this is marrow. That kind of separation requires the spirit, not intellect. And in that separation, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What's intent? Motive. What's really in there motivating you? I don't care about your sweet words or kind actions or your wonderful Christian behavior. You know, you can have wonderful Christian behavior and have a bad motive. Huh? Some people do good things to be seen and heard. And it, they're doing it more for them than helping people. Is that possible? Nod your head if you think that's possible. That somebody could actually be doing stuff for themselves more than helping people. But in the process of their behavior of helping people looks really good. Lately, Jennifer keeps reminding me <laughs> that in the fruit of the Spirit that we've been talking about, most of us love kindness. But goodness is not necessarily practiced. You need both. Goodness is what Jesus did when he turned over the money changers. Goodness is a, an, a willingness to confront. Now, if anybody likes to confront, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you need to deal with that. But nevertheless, goodness does and is willing to confront. And we confront issues that I know other people avoid. But I have to live with me. And I have to know that the uh, blood's not on my hands for not saying some of the things that everybody goes, whoa, we heard your message on this. Aren't you afraid of da 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 and the government and everything else? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we have a responsibility to use wisdom, but then again, to not be afraid to confront for the benefit of other people. There's a balance there. <clears throat> now, for the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than the two-edged sword. It divides asunder. And it discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What are you really thinking in your heart and the intent behind it? Now, when Jennifer saw that uh, the way I approached uh, a lot of emotional healing and, and saw a lot of changed lives, she said it was contrary to her counselor teaching. And... Uh, well, to this day, we're probably in a minority, although recently there are more and more material coming out on emotions after all these years. But in my time, when I was young, it was, uh, I remember even my friend Brian Simmons was taught by leading evangelicals, the one that did the Passion Translation, and all his leading instructors says, ignore your feelings. And he said they were wrong. You ignore your feelings, you end up having no place for the fruit of the Spirit and how to be moved with compassion. You can't, you can't overdo something like that. What they meant was, there was a half-truth in there. You can't live by your carnal emotions. But to me, my carnal emotions are my friends. You know why? When I get a carnal emotion, it's, Jesus isn't ruling now, Dennis. Use it to your advantage. Discern, distinguish. Right? And toxic emotions didn't come in until the fall. In the garden, they enjoyed the fruit of the Spirit, mind, will, emotion, spirit, and union and communion with God. After sin entered, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, all in a tiny portion of Scripture. That toxicity came with sin entered. So do you call those things sin? I say if you give place to the devil, they certainly can be, right? Don't give place. Don't let the sun down on your anger. Well, anyway, uh, uh, now there's at least two other people <laughs> that I know of that's actually emphasizing uh, the role of emotions in your heart makeup. But nonetheless, uh, 
the the need that Jennifer really wanted to investigate was why is what Dennis doing so much faster and easier and we were getting testimonies when we travel church to church <gasps> well that's too easy isn't that funny that's too easy well because you learn to do things the hard way and eventually it might work the hard way but easy sometimes can be intimidating and you want to write it off because it shouldn't be that easy the church has always made things hard they made the baptism in the Holy Spirit hard I saw Pentecostals that were waiting for it for 15, 20 years. <laughs> we do have a propensity to make something hard. <laughs> but nonetheless, salvation was hard until Luther came around and said, justification by faith. But emotional healing should not be hard. Emotional healing... And what Jennifer understood, she said that now even modern biology, as of the 90s, correct? In the 90s, modern biology started teaching emocognition, emovolition. Well, that'll radically, the church has to catch up, but, but uh, science and the Bible are not uh, argumentatively against each other. Uh, but emocognition means the emotions control your thinking and the emotions control your choices. Whenever I saw everybody wrestling with mental strongholds and spending months and years trying to deal with an ungodly thought, I said, that could be handled in one prayer session. One. The trouble is you're trying to go around the mountain and wear it like water wearing down a rock. And you know what? Eventually it may work. But that doesn't, I don't want to set up a system. I would rather know how to go directly to it and remove the power behind the thought, then renounce the thought, how to bring it strong. We're going to cover some of that. I want to pray for some of that. But in verse 12, it says, a discerner of the thoughts and the motives or the intents of the heart. And verse 13 was very helpful for me because it said, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things that are naked and open to the eyes of him. Boy, that impressed me. It's not an it. The Word of God is quick and powerful. Jesus is the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. You know what that tells me? I wasn't reading ink on a page. That what I was doing was I was meeting the author. I was meeting the author of that Word. I was meeting the living Word. And the living Word was discerning me. I got four pages of notes and I'm on the first quarter of page one. I don't think we're going to make it today. <laughs> All right. But once this is appreciated, your relationship will deepen with intimacy and fruitfulness will be the product. God gave me that threefold plan before I studied anybody's material, before I did any courses. He said, I'm going to get, reveal a truth to you. I'm going to give you light. The aha. And that truth, I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that truth. And then you test your own spirit to see if there's any fruit. Because mere intellectual understanding does not produce fruit. Intimacy produces fruit. I want to see changed life. Did it change your life? Is there fruit now? Go back to that word that you feel you had an aha moment for. Is it been written on the tablet of your heart to the degree that you own it and that you express it and you can actually see fruit from it, or did you just memorize something? No creature is hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. I don't know about you, but I want the Spirit of God. I want Jesus, the living Word, discerning me. I want him to separate all motives, good or bad, flesh or spirit. Okay? Now, Part two. <laughs> part two, which is like the second part of the page. <laughs> I got too much to say on this because this, this will gloriously change your life if applied. Go slow and allow that wonderful Holy Spirit to change your life. Okay, this, this is essential because we have so many people viewing 
Uh, and quite frankly, I'm surprised how many people are learning and seeing changed lives that are merely getting the YouTubes. And by the way, if it's really good, we take it off of YouTube and put it on the school. <laughs> so if you think you're getting good YouTubes, you ought to go on the online school and get all the best stuff because we take it off of YouTube and put it on the online school. That's your free part. Uh, and then you learn it in a sequential order. We have modules one through five. Now, why would we have modules one through five? Modules one through five is because if you learn one, it's like geometry. If you learn one, you're in a better shape for two. You learn two, you're prepared because of one and two for three. It's done purposely, sequentially. You can't get that by all the YouTube training. YouTube training is a little, little like a Christmas tree with a, a yellow bulb here and a red bulb there. Oh, that's a good bulb. But you put the picture together. It's, it's very difficult. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's difficult. Uh, the location of the heart. Out of the heart flows the issues of light. Uh, unless we locate our spirit heart correctly, uh, you can't effectively guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. So in the New Testament, that the, uh, the heart is the center of man's inward life and the sphere of divine influence. It's where we're touching God. Whenever the Bible talks about the heart as our innermost being, it is not referring to the physical heart. This is major, by the way. When we travel church to church, this was a major. Really? I always thought Jesus came into my blood pumper. No. No. Matter of fact, there's only one scripture that refers to the blood pumper in all of scripture. Hmm? In the New Testament. And that's that men's hearts will fail for fear. Well, yeah, you could live in such a dimension of fear, you can have a heart attack. But all of the rest of them refer to the innermost being. And in, whenever the Bible talks about that innermost being, it's not referring to the chest area. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the heart at our core or midsection, I was surprised when I would ask a, a, a group of people, uh, what do you call it? And women, more than men, said gut. They were not afraid of that word, gut, from the gut. Gut hunches actually are valid. There's a knower, there's as many neurons, almost as many, that you have in your head and spinal column and peripheral nerves as you do in the gut. Now this little blood pumper's got some few, it's like a chip. 40,000, Jennifer says, just my, my historian, uh, scientist, uh, front row person that feeds me my information. I really don't know this stuff that well. <laughs> but anyway, this is like a computer chip. The second brain and the gut, the neurons there, it's like a computer, computer, two computers. And this one informs that one. And I'll just give you a simple example of uh, this is also the center of the epicenter of your spirit that fills you from head to toe. But the heart is mind, will, emotions, spirit. And in this area is the seat of the emotions, conscience. Didn't you ever do something wrong and I go eh, down there like eh, eh. That really means you should stop it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Rethink what you just said. <laughs> you may have to change your action. You may pay later. <clears throat> now the average married man knows. You get the, <clears throat> you're going you're gonna to hear about it later. <laughs> if a woman says to her husband, can I go play tennis? Go. Don't go. If it goes down here, go. Mm. <laughs> you can't. You have to discern the source of that statement, not just the statement by itself. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> in the New Testament, the seat of our emotions, the moral nature, spiritual life. John seven thirty eight. Everybody knows that. Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. All right. It's uh, uh, koilia is actually the literal meaning of belly, abdomen, bowels, stomach, and womb. 
I'd say it's down here. And actually, you know what else is down here? Conscience. <laughs> Creativity. That's why we need the freedom as a believer because it's, I mean, even this country, because of religious freedom, uh, went from ox cart to the moon in a very short period of time. But the creativity is a product of man's spirit, and it needs the freedom to be released and expressed. Creativity is a product of your spirit. Uh, if you have writer's block or, or uh, singers will claim that they're writing a song and they hit a block, a lot of times it's release it to God for a believer. Release it back to God and the creativity will start to flow again. You're probably trying too hard to get what you want. You put a demand and an expectation on yourself or other people and you actually crimp the hose. <laughs> Just your little free, free part. I get that every Sunday. If I, I don't have a message for Sunday. I don't have, in the early days, I was a mess. Because you either got to go on Sunday, you got to perform, right? But you die to that eventually and realize that God's never, has God ever disappointed me? No. But He's made me surrender and yield to it that it's in there somewhere and it'll come out in due season. Isn't that a better way to live? It's in there. It'll come out in due season. But you quit trying so hard. Now, uh, <clears throat> your, your Bible heart, when you, when you got saved, you didn't ask Jesus into your head. We know that. You have to believe in your heart to be saved. And the transformation that we've seen in so many people is learning to forgive from the heart, Matthew 18. Because you can forgive from the head and be like Jennifer when we got married. She goes, I've been trying to forgive this person that, that you know, two years. Two years. I'm going, to, well, there's something wrong. I know you're sincere or you wouldn't be trying for two years. But you are sincerely wrong. You're doing it from the head rather than from the heart. Because forgiveness from the heart is just like salvation. Peace is the internal evidence that there was a supernatural exchange or a transaction. And it's instant. If it's not instant, you're doing it cerebrally. It's what happens in the heart that counts. Uh, and the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the innermost parts of the belly. So it's really... When David, in the Old Testament, says, Search me, O God, for secret faults. He wasn't operating out of his intellect, was he? What was he saying? Sir, they're secret to me, but God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. If someone's going to fix me, you're the one that I trust. Show me what's wrong. Search me, O God, for... And here's the emo cognition, emo volition, just like they're teaching in science class now in biology. The emotions control the thinking, the emotions control the choices. In the scripture, it's search me, O God, for anxious thoughts. What kind of thoughts? Anxious thoughts. So the motive or the power behind the thought is fear. Anxious thoughts, hurtful choices, hurtful ways, hurtful choices. If I can deal with the hurtful choices, I'll make better choices. If I can deal with the anxious behind the thought, I will have better thoughts. I want your thoughts, not my thoughts. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and those are not God thoughts if there's anxiety attached to them or hurt. And when you forgive, if it doesn't take the hurt, you did not forgive. There is a supernatural transaction, and the evidence of true forgiveness always changes to peace. Peace is the fruit of the Spirit that something has transpired. There was a work of the cross that clearly have been demonstrated internally. I've seen so many people, and actually they would be embarrassed. It's like when I was a young, a young believer, I, I, God gave me a vision, two visions. One was a dandelion, why, I don't know. But grown adults were hiding behind a dandelion thinking, you can't see me. Kind of like a kid does with a blanket, puts a blanket over it. You can't see me because I can't see you. And the other one was, as my first year as a pastor, I had all of these people that were much older than me, 
And God showed me a x-ray machine like, and it went like this over that congregation. And I saw big, big heads and little itsy bitsy atrophied spirits. He says, just speak to the spirit. <laughs> Don't worry about what their heads know. And it was true. The education, I had a Harvard graduate who was doing 10 engineers' jobs, and I was discipling him, and I was still pretty much a baby Christian myself. Uh, and it was in an office Bible study. And he, he told me that because of discernment, he called me the claw, because I, I would call him on everything he did with a bad motive, everything. And he says, it's, I've come to realize, now this is a brilliant person, I've come to realize that the education of the mind comes through much study, but the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. And this was when I was working in the office in the factory. I was in time study, and he was an engineer, and he had literally replaced all the engineers that they had laid off. He did, was able to do their job. And in his spare time, he would go to the library and find something that would interest him. I didn't have any place to put that. <laughs> but the education of the mind comes through much study, but the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. That's where we need to be much smarter and proficient. The spiritual man will discern all things. Now, the anointing flows from the belly. We see... A lot of scriptures, King James particularly, actually had it right. Belly, bowels. It showed the gut. And one of the easiest things that Jennifer shared with me was how this informs this. The emotional brain informs the natural brain, not the natural brain. Remember how we used to say in church, I got to get that from my head down into my spirit. I actually need to get it down in your spirit and let it go up to your head. Works better that way. But Jennifer said, like we were standing in this room and suddenly there was a loud crash. Before your head knows what that crash was, emotions will cascade through your entire body and go up to your head until your head can interpret, oh, it was just a ladder fell in the hallway. Your emotions registered first. You jumped. And it went to the brain and said, eventually you saw that it was just a ladder falling down. Emo cognition, emo volition. By the way, your will is here, not here. We traveled to churches, we saw 98% would say, where's your will, would point to their temple. No, that's your thoughts. That's where you give consent. Here's a CYO. Note takers ought to write this down. CYO. Here's how it actually operates spiritually. Consent, yield, obey. Where, where are you obeying from? From the heart. It is, this will make the scriptures make more sense. It is God who is at work to will and to perform. Visual helps understand the concept. Here's another one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He'll direct your path. You can read that scripture. You can memorize that scripture. You can quote that scripture. But this is what it should look like. Trust in the Lord. Spirit to spirit. Trust in the Lord. Yield, surrender. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Mind, will, emotions, spirit. That's the whole heart. All your heart. Lean not on this. Look at it. doesn't say throw it out. It just says don't lean on this, but acknowledge Him. And that word acknowledge means through divine, intimate connection. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct your path. For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. I'll tell you what, in, in uh, this church, when we try to train people, knowing that you've not had that kind of teaching, no matter how long you've been a Christian, we just said this, 
Whenever you have a question about something, there's only two answers. Forgiveness or peace. And you can't mess up. How do I know if, if a word of God really became life in me and it changed me? How would you know? Peace. Peace is God himself, but you need to understand there's peace with God. There's the peace of God and the God of peace that crushes the enemy beneath your feet. It needs to be expressed that way. All right. Okay. I think I talk too much. I don't know. How many understand the will? The will has to be yielded. You have three choices with the will. You can, oh yeah? When someone confronts you, oh yeah? You can push back. You can surrender, be a doormat. Just lay down and let people walk on you. Or you can uh, avoid them. Fight, they call that fight, flight. And we added the word faint. <laughs> you either push back, run away, or lay down and be a doormat. But in the kingdom of God, there's a beautiful, lovely, spiritual fourth choice. And when I was trying to understand this, God gave me uh, the scripture of Jesus when he confronted, whoa, he, in the temple. What'd they want to do? They wanted to push him off a cliff. I'd say he, his goodness was confrontive. <laughs> the fruit of the spirit of goodness. And did he fight back? Did he run away? Did he lay down and let him walk all over him? No. It says he walked through the crowd. The light bulb went on. There's a fourth choice. You don't have to push back. You don't have to run away. And you do not have to be a doormat. That's for the carnal man. Those are the only choices you have. But for the believer, you've got a fourth choice. Surrender and yield to God. And let the God of peace walk you through the circumstances of life. No person can, you can't, you know, the blame game's over as a Christian. You can't just blame people. Oh, those people made my life what it is. No, your response to those people is what made your life what it is. You and God are, if God is in control, the blame game's over. Any Christian that still blames people is still in a need of great repentance. Really. There's no meekness in that at all. It's all the blame game. The blame game is carnality. The blame game is sin. And you're actually pretending to be a Christian if you're in blame. You're pretending to be a Christian. That's a religious person. That's a mask. That's hypocrisy. That's a false face. The blame game died when you became a new believer. Forgiveness is the option. Now, the one part that people really get messed up with is they don't know the difference between reconciliation and forgiveness. Forgiveness is one way. Jesus didn't wait for them to reconcile. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was releasing the loving forgiveness even from the cross. I don't think they all reconciled. But it's for whosoever. All right? Okay, I didn't get very far on how to minister and receive ministry from the heart. I wanted to cover how to take down a mental stronghold. I want to do it, but there's always, there's always next week, right? Everybody's going, please, please. I want to go eat lunch. All right. So, who would like to volunteer to come up and just get prayer? Anybody volunteer? On the camera, I know it's awkward. Come on. You want to get. Let's stand over here. I've got the little robot. All right. I want to start out with praying for an emotional healing. Are you open to that? All right. Close your eyes. First person or situation. Nod your head. I'll say that again. Hmm? What do you say? Okay. What was the answer or the question? No, just think of a person. Oh, okay. And nod your head. We're not going to say names on camera. Mm -hmm. Feel the feeling. Nod your head. Can you feel the feeling that's attached mm -hmm. down here? Picture the person. Yeah. 
Okay, I want you to receive forgiveness. You're doing it. Receive forgiveness for taking in that feeling that's attached to that person. And I want you to release forgiveness like out of my belly is flowing. I'm releasing from my heart. There, you're doing it. Releasing forgiveness to that person that you saw up here. Nod your head when this changed to peace. And it already did, though, right? Okay, I'm going by discernment. I, I purposely don't tell them what I discern. I use my discernment to know if they're doing it right. Because they have to know. What, how did we start this message? You need to discern what's going on in you. If I can feel the tip of the iceberg through the gift of discerning of spirits, the tip of the iceberg, how much more responsible are you to know what's going on in you? You know, it's more important you discern you than discern anybody else. But you will learn to discern other people when your heart's right and you've let God discern you. You, you are the patient before you're the doctor. You want to try it again? See if there's anybody else in there that might need to be forgiven. And intellectually, we think we did. You know, person or situation, nod your head. Mm -hmm. Feel the feeling. Nod your head. Mm -hmm. Let for, uh, you, you're getting way ahead of me now. You're for, receiving. <laughs> you were receiving forgiveness, weren't you? Because it was mm -hmm. like drinking it in. All right, you're drinking. You're receiving. Now release forgiveness to them. Why do I have them receive forgiveness for having harbored that? It teaches you personal responsibility. And it will keep you from being a victim. All right. Now here's the way I want to end this. We call this prevenient prayer. This is the way we pray every morning. It only takes seconds. I, right now I release forgiveness to whosoever might cross my path this day to irritate me or whatever. <laughs> I am praying ahead of the devil. Mm -hmm. I am releasing forgiveness in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good job. Okay, she, they came all the way from Arizona. We got to get her on camera. She knows our material probably better than some of the people in the room. Her and her husband have studied this. Okay, let's pray through an emotional healing. Close your eyes. First person or situation, just nod your head. No analysis. Just whatever pops in, no matter how silly. Feel the feeling. Oh. You, put a, you want to put a name on that? The feeling? This helps you um, develop a, a, a language, an emotional language. I think maybe, wait, maybe rejection. Mm -hmm. Now, see, for me, it just feels like hurt. Hurt, rejection, same thing. You call it what you let them call it, whatever they want to call it, because they're developing an emotional language, right there through that re rejection. I let Jesus, the Forgiver in me. Go to it, and you just did it, through it. But I don't like to say you just did it, because you have to know that it changed the peace, not have somebody tell you. This is the opposite of even a lot of counseling. Counseling wants to give you advice. They want to do it to you. They want to minister to you. What I'm trying to teach you is how to go to Jesus yourself and not need me. But what we're doing here is we're bearing witness so that you have a dual witness. There, that's it. That's how I taught Jennifer. Once it's there, that's it. Then they have their own subjective place to identify. Oh, okay, I can do that. And you did it effectively. It doesn't have to be lightning bolts. Now, what was the answer if this is a test? How do I know if I did it right? I need a, a very specific prayer prayer for you. I can't feel the feelings. I can remember the feelings, but I did something. Okay. Here's, here's, I started throwing my feelings into the ocean, so I actually can't feel the feelings. That's why I okay. had to guess. I can remember the feelings, but okay. I do feel the peace. If you can remember the feeling, you can do it. Okay. 
just go put your hand down here. That's the seat of the emotions. I can remember the feeling, but that means I blocked it out. Okay? As an act of my will down here, I choose. I allow myself to feel momentarily just a small part of it. Nod your head. Just a little bit is all you need to feel. So I'm not getting any, I'm, I'm feeling peace, but I'm not getting any like... No, no. We don't want peace. Peace means you already did it, unless you already did it. I think I already did it. So okay. Peace. Oh, that's good. <laughs> let's do one more. Let's, let's, let's do one more. Person or situation. Go for the hard stuff while you're here. You're traveling through. <laughs> Even the ones you think you've done it before, but it was really difficult and you, want, you need the assurance now. Person or situation. Nod your head. Feel the feeling. Remember, you don't have to have, if it was a trauma event, you don't have to go into trauma. All you have to do is feel it a little bit, enough to give it to Jesus legitimately. He can't take something you won't give him. Allow yourself to feel You've got lots of hurt in there. Albert. You can call it rejection. I yield it to the Jesus in me. He's the only one that can take your shame and sorrow. He took it on the cross. It was good to me. And there's actually, your face don't show it yet, but down here, I felt a joy bubble. <laughs> Did you feel that? I'm feeling your peace. Yeah. Well, let's feel, here's the way I trained Jennifer. If she felt the peace, close your eyes. Let's go deeper. There's, that means like I'm going to yield, like I'd fall right through the floor. I'm so yielded. Yield even more. Okay, here's the other thing we do. To find out how, uh, yielding, what it feels like, you're, you're not totally, totally yielding. Fall back into my hand about six inches. That feeling right there, that's yielding. It's unnatural to go backwards. Nobody wants to fall backwards. You have to, there you go, whoa. Do you feel the increase in the spirit when you do that? Peace increases proportional to yielding. That's good. That's good. Very good. Let's get the hubby now. I'm going to see if you can yield. Better check the yield out. Because all healing requires yielding it to God. All right? I want you to yield. I want you to fall back into my hand about six inches. Now you feel when you're going like this. You let go, you hold on. You let go, you hold on. When you let go, peace increase. There you go. Can you tell the difference in you? That's yielding. Now, you can do that without falling. Now, without falling, yield. Okay. I think you got it. All right. First person or situation, nod your head. Now, if we were on a one-on-one, -on -one, I would get information, and I could show you some other things, but we're not going to do that while we're on camera. The person or situation, you nodded your head. Feel the feeling. Nod your head when you feel the feeling that's attached to that person or situation. As an act of my will, I choose to feel. Okay? You feel something? Men don't have a big emotional vocabulary, so it's not peace. It's yuck. Okay? I let Jesus the forgiver. I receive forgiveness for knowingly or unknowingly harboring that yuck. You receive forgiveness down here. That's not just agreeing with my words. You've got to do it here. I receive forgiveness for bearing that yuck from Jesus the forgiver in me. And I'm releasing. Okay, there you're doing. Whoa! I'm releasing forgiveness to whosoever is flowing out of me. I'm, I'm going to take this a step further. I'm going to release them of any demands or expectations to change. And you can talk to your wife about this, whatever it is. There you go. 
I release demands and expectations. You can forgive somebody and still hold on demands and expectations for them to change. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Now test yourself. Picture the person. Close your eyes. Do you have peace? Yeah, you did it. That was a transaction that takes place. This is not lightning bolts. This is day-to-day -day living. You should be able to do this while you're driving a car, except the close your eyes part. <laughs> okay? All right. Yep, we're good. All right, let's stand on our feet and close with a word of prayer. Did you learn anything by observing? Yeah. Hmm? Then we're hoping that people watching by video can, can see it demonstrated. We're too used to lightning bolts. I've seen lightning bolts. I've seen people, oh, you ought to see when they get filled. Filled is like when you, all that I needed and didn't receive, I forgive mom and dad for not giving me all that I needed and didn't. I forgive them, and then it was all that I needed and didn't receive. I'm getting directly from God. And the, the anointing floods the room. All that I needed and didn't receive. You know, a lot of times you're, you're demanding and expecting to get from somebody something they never got themselves. How are they going to give it to you? You know, but you can get whatever you need through God. Security, acceptance, affection, attention. Whatever it was that you didn't get, that you try so desperately to get from people, you release the demand and expectation. You forgive them for not giving it to you, release the demands and, and then put your expectations on God and say, God, all that I needed and didn't receive, all the affection, the attention, the security, the safety, whatever I needed, I have it in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. You've Amen. been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.